Well, good evening, everybody. Good to see you this evening and good to see, well, I can't see those of you who are joining us online, but glad you're with us tonight. We're going to continue our study of the Gospel of John this evening. And uh, before we do that, just like to take a, a bit of time for prayer and let's come before the Lord, shall we? And prepare our hearts to receive everything he has to give us. And, and tonight, uh, seriously, th there are so many good words from Jesus that we're going to be looking at. And, and they speak so powerfully in, into our, our souls, into our minds into our spirit, you name it, they, they do it. So let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we praise and honor you. you. You are the living God and we bless your holy name. We thank you that you are good. We rejoice in the gift of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, our coming King, the one who has redeemed us from death and the grave, the one who is coming back to restore all things and who will reign. We thank you that we have been brought into to your, your kingdom through the Lord Jesus and in him we have eternal life, a life that begins right now and will continue forever. We pray this evening that you would speak in power into each one of our hearts and lives. We thank you that your word is not only truth, it is life-changing truth. May that life-changing truth impact each of us in a very powerful way tonight. We pray that in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Well, what I'd like to do this evening is uh, pick up where we had left off last time and uh, would ask that you open your Bibles to the very end, the last sentence of John chapter 14, which is where we ended last week. And uh, Jesus, if you will recall, has been speaking to his disciples. This is on the night that is often referred to as Maundy Thursday or Holy Thursday. It is the, the evening of Passover, and uh, within hours, Jesus will be arrested in the garden tried and then taken to Calvary and uh, executed. He is speaking to his disciples. He has washed their feet. He has told them that one of them will betray him and uh, then has announced to Peter that before the evening is over, Peter will deny Jesus three times. After that, he goes on to emphasize some very critical points as, as he stresses with his disciples in these closing comments. And as I've mentioned before, John gives us so much detail and gives us really an insider's view of all that was going on that evening. But after Jesus has talked to them and reminded them that he is the only way to the Father, after he has uh, shared with them the, the truth that anyone who has seen him has seen the Father, we know what God is like when we look Look at the Lord Jesus Christ. And now as he concludes these remarks, he makes this comment. This is the end of chapter 14, uh, verse 31. Jesus says, come now, let us leave. Without that sentence, we would have assumed that the words spoken here in chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17 were all uttered in the upper room. But instead what we learn, apparently this is when they leave the upper room and head out. And that clue gives us some real insight, I believe, into what follows. Uh, again, we cannot prove this, but if indeed the disciples left when Jesus said, come let us go, and I'm just going to assume that the disciples are a little different than our grandkids. <coughs> because this weekend I, I told the grandkids, okay guys, let's go. Uh, but I also knew I better do that about an hour in advance because that's how long it's going to take to get them all rounded up and into the car and, and off. And, and we got there on time. We got to, to worship on time. Uh, but, you know, you got to plan ahead. But I'm going to assume that when Jesus said to the disciples, come now, let us leave, that they left. And uh, here is what we believe we know as a result. There is a very ancient Christian tradition which says that the disciples met with Jesus in the upper room, as the New Testament tells us, and that that upper room was located in the southwestern corner of the ancient city of Jerusalem. Uh, if that tradition is correct, it means the following. This is a, a, a photograph of a uh, architect's model of the city of Jerusalem at the time of the second temple at the time of Jesus. This particular model, I've shown you bits and pieces of that model before. 
the, the model is located at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. It is a 150th scale model of what Jerusalem may have looked like. Uh, this is built on the basis of the, the material that has survived and at that time what, what had been revealed through archaeological digs and so forth. We can't say for certain this is what it looked like, but it's at least an attempt, a, a stab in the dark at, at what it looked like. And assuming that Jesus and the disciples, as the tradition said, met in the south western corner of the city on the western hill. It would mean that they were meeting somewhere on the far left-hand side of the screen, lower part of the screen. We know then from there they would have gone to the Garden of Gethsemane. John tells us that, so do the other gospel authors. And what that would mean is this. It would mean that they would have started in this area over here on the far left-hand side and then moved to the east and a little bit to the north over to the, uh, the Mount of Olives. Now the Mount of Olives is not on this model. And uh, if I may just kind of indicate what is on this model, right down here marked in purple, this is the Kidron Valley. The uh, Mount of Olives would have been to the, uh, the east or to the right of that. And it's there that the Garden of Gethsemane was located. But Jesus and his disciples would have moved across the city or gone outside the city and down into the, uh, the Hinnom Valley in the south and then up the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives. Either way, they would have passed by the great temple. And if the temple was located at the traditional site, they would have passed by it. If the temple was located at uh, other sites that had been suggested, they still would have passed by it. What we know about the temple is this. On the face of the temple, the, the sanctuary itself, and keep in mind, as Josephus, the Jewish historian, describes the city of Jerusalem in general and the temple in particular, what we are told is that the temple was made out of white limestone and marble. It was 150 feet high. You know, you're talking a pretty, high, pretty tall building. And on the, the face of the temple, by the, the entrance where the priests would enter the sanctuary, there was a massive gold grapevine. Josephus tells us that it covered the entire face and went up very, very high. So at least 100 feet would be our best guesstimate. Uh, that golden grapevine, according to ancient eyewitnesses, had on it clusters of grapes made out of solid gold. Those grape clusters stood about six feet high. Uh, so this massive, and now keep in mind, it is nighttime, Passover. One of the things that we know from the writings of the rabbis is that during the great feasts of the Lord, Passover, Pentecost, or uh, uh, Shavuot, and uh, Tabernacles, or Sukkot, that during those feasts, massive torches were placed in the... Uh, um, mark it here on this next photo. Massive torches were placed in the uh, court of the women, this area right here. Those huge torches stood 75 feet high. There were four of them, and on each one of those torches there were multiple, multiple containers holding olive oil, and uh, they were lit, and it provided a tremendous amount of light in the temple. It could be seen throughout the city of Jerusalem. In the day and age before electric lights and street lights and neon signs, it would have stood out in a, a, just an eye-popping fashion and that light would have reflected off the golden grapevine. And so when we get to chapter 15, it is quite possible, in fact, quite likely, that as Jesus says, I am the true vine, he and the disciples are actually looking at this massive golden grapevine on the uh, eastern face of the, the sanctuary. And what Jesus says now is absolutely startling and dramatic in so many ways. Uh, if you turn to uh, John chapter 15, verse 1, we read these words. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. I am the true vine. Uh, for us, we say that's a very picturesque thing to say. 
if he was saying it by the temple with this massive golden grapevine, you'd say, that's pretty dramatic. You know, that, that's, that's a, a real choreography. But for devout Jewish people like Jesus' disciples, these words would have had far more significance than they often do for us in the Western world. What, uh, what the disciples, as, as individuals who were students of the scripture, who had learned the scriptures from the time they were little, what would most likely have come to mind for them is the fact that throughout the Hebrew scriptures, the people of Israel are compared to a grapevine. And in one particularly significant scripture, in, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 5, we have the song of the vineyard that uh, the prophet Isaiah was given by God. This is about 700 years before the, the time of Jesus. And Isaiah uses what, what Jewish people would have called a mashal. Um, uh, some would translate it as a parable, but it's actually more than a parable. It, it is a, an analogy. It is a story that illustrates in multiple ways profound truth. And uh, here is the Song of the Vineyard from Isaiah 5. If you'd like to read along, feel free to turn in your own Bibles. Hang on to, to uh, John chapter 15. But here we are, chapter 5 of the prophet Isaiah, verse 1. Isaiah writes, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared, off, cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And so as Jesus says, I am the true vine, quite possibly in the shadow of this massive grapevine, he is talking about the nation of Israel. The vine represents Israel, what God intended the, the nation to be. And now Jesus is saying, I am the true vine. Uh, the prophet Isaiah had been given a prophetic word from God saying because the people of Jerusalem and Judah had rejected God, the temple itself would be destroyed and uh, God would bring judgment on his own people. Jesus, just hours earlier, had said the same thing as he took his disciples to the Mount of Olives and said, I tell you, not one stone will be left standing on another and the, the temple is going to be destroyed because they have rejected me, the Messiah, the, the one whom God has sent. Now Jesus points at that vine, perhaps, and he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Jesus is saying he is everything that God intends for his people to be. He is the real vine, and uh, it's only by being connected to him that we have life and forgiveness and hope. He, he is, he's saying, I'm the Messiah, and uh, unless you receive me as such, judgment will ultimately come. It's a powerful word, but it's also a comforting word. And uh, that's why I've got John 15, one and two up here on the screen. Uh, there is so much here that we need to, uh, we need to harvest, okay? So John 15, verses 1 and 2, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. And with this mashal, with this analogy, uh, 
Jesus is saying that he is the one who gives life to the people of God. He is the true vine. His father is the, the vine dresser or the vine keeper, the gardener. And, and he's saying we need to be connected to him. And in the verses that follow, Jesus is going to talk about the fact that it's only in being connected to him that we have life. And if we're disconnected from him, we will end up being tossed out. And so what he's saying is, make sure you remain in me. Now, this is one of those verses where I personally believe, and I want to stress, this is my personal belief. I personally believe that the translators have not translated this accurately. And uh, here is why. The word that is translated cuts off, and you see it underlined up there on the screen. Uh, it, is, it is a very interesting Greek word that John uses here. The, the word is iro, and its primary meaning is to raise or to lift up. It, it is the word that is used, for instance, for taking up one's cross. It is the word that is used to, to describe lifting things up high and, uh, and a very common Greek word. That word cuts off in English, that is not the, the, the real meaning. The, the, the Greek word kopto would be a, a word for cut off. But iro means to raise or lift up or to take away and remove. The other word that is used and is translated he prunes is directly related to that word iro. It has a prefix in front of it and, and the word translated prunes is literally in the Greek kathiro and it means to cleanse or to purify. It is obvious that John is using two words that are very, very similar, same root, to get a, a very powerful idea across. And, and I believe that one of the reasons translators translate this the way they do is because often translators have never really taken a look at how you take care of grapevines. Now, Jesus specifically says, my father is the gardener. He I rose every branch in me that bears no fruit. The translators say, well, take away, lift up. That doesn't make any sense. He must be cutting it off. But later on, Jesus will say, if you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. There's no indication here that Jesus is going to cut off a good branch. But when you raise grapevines, one of the things that uh, we, we know is that if a vine lies on the ground, it's not going to be fruitful. And to have a fruitful grapevine, you need to lift the branches up so they get plenty of sunlight. And so a good, a, a good gardener is going to take a look at the grapevines, and if the uh, vine is producing abundant fruit, the, the gardener will trim it and prune it a little bit, purify it, cleanse it, as the word kathairo means. Uh, on the other hand, if it's not bearing fruit, the gardener's going to look at that and say, well, it, it's lying on the ground. We need to lift it up. And, and then the normal meaning of the word makes perfect sense. If a branch that's connected to Jesus the vine is not bearing fruit, what does God do? He lifts us up so that we can bear fruit, so that we can become everything he desires us to be. And if we're already producing fruit, he prunes us. And sometimes pruning may not be particularly comfortable, but it does great things. When you prune a plant, it becomes far more productive. And so it is tempting to look at this and think of this, well, here's the bad stuff. He's going to cut off those that aren't bearing fruit, and he's going to prune those that are. Instead, I believe this is a very positive statement. He is saying, if a branch in me is not bearing fruit, my father and I, we're going to lift it up. We're going to lift up that branch so it can be productive. And if the branch is bearing fruit, we're going to prune it so that it can be even more productive. It's all about producing fruit. And that's what will come now in the rest of Jesus' words as he talks about bearing fruit, which brings up the obvious question. What does it mean to bear fruit? And there, I believe the Bible gives us some very clear answers. Uh, one of the first answers from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Paul writes and he says, the fruit of the Spirit 
is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. What does the Holy Spirit produce in the lives of all of us who trust him, who have repented and received Jesus Christ as Savior? The answer is he produces fruit, and it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Please note, nine things are mentioned there. But Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is. He did not make a grammatical error. He is stressing that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, it's all one fruit. It's like a cluster of grapes. And it fits perfectly with the whole notion of the grape vine. I am the vine. You are the branches. You know? And uh, in addition to that, bearing fruit is leading other people to a knowledge of the living God, bringing other people to Christ, sharing our faith with our families, with our friends, with the people God brings into our lives. That is bearing fruit. And so Jesus' desire is that every one of us attached to him, branches that are connected to the true vine, bear fruit for God. In the change that occurs in our lives through faith, and in the way we witness to that faith in daily living. Let's go on, shall we? Jesus goes on and he says this. Verse 3, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Uh, the word of Christ changes us. It transforms, it prunes us. You know? and, and Jesus is saying, you're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. The important thing is to be connected to the Lord Jesus Christ. Branches attached to the vine. It is only as we're attached to him, the vine, that we receive that life-giving, that life-giving, nurturing spirit of the living God. That, that transforms and renews us. And that's at the heart of everything that Jesus is saying here. Well, that's not where he stops. We go on to, to verse five. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And, and again, this is one of those verses that we just wanna hang on to. You know, we human beings can so easily be diverted in our attention and think about ourselves and what's going on around us. And what Jesus is saying is we need to be connected to him above everything else. And if we are connected to him, if we remain in him and he is in us, we will bear abundant fruit. And, and what a powerful promise. You know, th these, are, these are gracious words. And what our Savior is saying is, apart from me, you can't do anything. But with me, there is no limit to what the Father can do. There is no limit, Jesus says, to what I can accomplish in and through you. And, and so that's where we want to be. We want to be connected to him, bearing fruit for the living God. And, and that only comes because of his power at work within us. Apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. And then he goes on. He says, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. And again, I believe this points to the, what I would say the proper translation of the opening words is. You know, any branch that does not bear fruit, but any branch that is in me, is lifted up so that it will bear fruit. On the other hand, Jesus is saying, if you're not connected to me, you're going to wither and die. You and I will not survive apart from him. I, I think, for instance, Jan and I got back from Michigan yesterday, and when we drove into the driveway, saw apparently we had gotten quite a bit of wind, and, and there were branches down in the driveway. And uh, you know what's going to happen to those things. They, they're going to quickly dry up, even though it's been really wet. <laughs> a, a branch apart from the tree just won't survive. And Jesus is saying, apart from him, we don't survive either. We, we spiritually dry up. He is calling us to a, a relationship with him, intimately connected to him who is the true vine. And, and he goes on, he says, verse seven, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. 
This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And those are just incredibly powerful words. And this whole section, Jesus is speaking to his disciples now on, you know, just hours before he is arrested and tried. And his concern is to make sure that they understand the truth. It, sometimes we, we get into the a situation where we read this and say, well, he just keeps saying the same thing. He keeps saying, you know, you need to be connected to me and uh, you need the Holy Spirit. And by the way, you ought to be praying. And if you pray in my name, the Father's going to answer and you need to love one another. And we say, well, he just keeps saying the same thing over and over and over again. Why would he do that? And the answer is because we need to hear it. And he is speaking at, at the critical juncture in his ministry. And he's telling his disciples, look, here's what's coming, guys. You need to be ready, you need to be prepared, and you need to be in me. You know, I, I still think back to childhood. There were certain things my parents told us all the time. One of the things my kid sister and I used to laugh about, because every night before bed, my mom would say the same thing. She would say, go to the toilet, wash your hands, and brush your teeth. You know? And we used to imitate her, you know, we'd try to say it in her voice and her tone and, and her cadence. But we did it. And to this day, you know, it's been a long time since I was a little kid at home. Uh, to this day, I still remember that, you know, go to the toilet, wash your hands, and brush your teeth. And I remember what came after that. Now, let's pray. And, and you know, that's what we did all the time. And, and we said a prayer by rote. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. But we also prayed for family. We prayed for the things that were going on in our lives. And, and you know, we were taught very early to talk to God. And not just go through the motions, but to share with God the joys of the day, the needs of the day, the, the pains of the day. Um, those are important things to pass on. And, and Jesus wants to pass on to his disciples these fundamental truths that alone keep them anchored in him in the good times and in the difficult times. And difficult times are going to come just in a matter of minutes and hours. And, and so he is focusing in on this. This, by the way, is a very Hebrew way of speaking. If you look, for instance, in Hebrew poetry and in the writings of the Bible, classic example, John's first epistle. It's the same sort of thing. It's circular. It keeps saying the same thing over and over again. And it's not because John doesn't have anything else to say and he just keeps saying the same thing in different ways. It's because God wants to make sure that we understand this. The Holy Spirit is trying to impress upon us. These are critical things. And everything that Jesus speaks about in these chapters, 14, 15, 16, and 17, is to emphasize to his early disciples and us the importance of abiding in him, the importance of listening to the Spirit of God, the importance of being people of prayer, and above all else, the importance of loving as we have first been loved by him. And so that theme just continues over and over again. Well, let's, let's go on then. Uh, verse uh, 9, Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Uh, again, one of those brief words from Jesus that is just so compelling and powerful. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. You know, today, in our lives, there are many times when we feel like, you know, what has happened? Why is this going on, God? Why, why don't you seem to care? And what Jesus is saying is, as the Father has loved him, so he has loved us. And we want to remain in that love. To remain in that love means that we not only continue to walk by faith, but we hang on to those truths in the good times as well as in the most difficult of times. Jesus says, you know, the Father has loved him. And you think of the way the Father speaks during the ministry of Jesus at his baptism. This is my beloved Son. With him I'm well pleased. As the Father speaks at the Mount of Transfiguration, this is my Son whom I love. Listen to him. You know, the Father is pleased with the Lord Jesus. Does that mean that everything goes smoothly in Jesus' life? To the contrary, you know, he, he's on his way to the cross, but he's saying no matter what is going on, you and I need to know 
that just as the Father loves the Son, so also the Son of God loves us. I think of that great, great children's hymn that is a profound, profound hymn. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That is true, and that is something you and I need to cling to in every situation of life, but particularly in the difficult times. And what Jesus is saying is, I love you. You know, the enemy loves to play with our minds and our souls. He loves to plant seeds of doubt that say, you know, does God really care about you? You're worthless. You know, you're, you've blown it. You're no good. And, you know, yada, yada, yada. And what we need to do in those situations is to listen to Jesus and not the enemy. Because Jesus says you are loved. And even as the Father has loved him, he loves us. And that is profound, that is life-changing, that renews the soul. Every human being needs to know that he or she is loved. You know, the, the cause of so much anxiety, uh, sadness, depression, discouragement, is the feeling that I am unloved. And what God is saying is, oh, you are loved. <laughs> In fact, God so loved the world, as John tells us, that he gave his one and only son. You know? And Jesus is emphasizing that here again with his disciples. I've loved you, remain in my love. And then he goes on. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. Now, some people look at that and they say, well, does that mean that we're saved because we keep Jesus' commands? No, it means that we keep Jesus' commands because we're saved. You know, we are saved, the Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, we are saved by grace through faith in Christ and in Him alone so that no one can boast. You know, this is not something we've done. This is a gift of God so that no one can boast. Jesus is not contradicting that. He's simply saying, when you're saved, it is going to make a difference in the way you live. And the difference it makes is, when I realize that the Son of God died for me and I am committed to Him as my Savior and my Lord, I want to do what pleases Him. My life changes. I, I change. doesn't mean that I'm perfect or that you're perfect. There are no perfect people other than the Son of the living God, but we are being perfected. And the day will come when we will be made pure and free and whole. Uh, in the meantime, Jesus says, Obey what I tell you. Do what I tell you. Not to earn my love, but because you have my love. He goes on. He says, uh, verse 11, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Now think about that. He's saying, I've told you this so that you'll have my joy and that your joy will be complete. Um, that's a promise. And by the way, I might add, that is a verse that especially struck me this morning. Uh, as some of you know, we just got back from being with our, our daughter and son-in-law and our grandkids. And, and we had a wonderful time. And I'll be very honest, we drove back yesterday, 10 hours in the car. It was rainy and, you know, we're driving through low-hanging cloud and so forth. And it's just like, oh, you know. And, and this morning when I got up, I, you know, I was a little tired. And, I, you know, I'm not proud to say this, but I'll be honest with you. I really didn't want to come in this morning. I, I would have preferred to just sit in front of the fireplace and, and relax a little bit, you know. And, and so I got into the car and I'm driving out of our neighborhood and, and uh, I was just talking to God and, and I said, you know, Lord, would you give me some joy today? <laughs> I'd like some joy. And I sensed at that point the Holy Spirit saying, that's not something you ask for. That's something you already have. And, and these words of Jesus, you know, they, it, I say this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Does the Bible say, ask God for joy? I, I, I asked myself that as I was driving in, and I can't think of a time offhand where it ever says in Scripture, ask God to give you joy. What it does say is, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. You know, we have joy, and the joy is in Christ Jesus. 
And as a result, as I drove out of our, our neighborhood, turned on to East Bush Lake Road in the, I don't know, 250 yards or something like that between the, the turn and the stoplight, my attitude changed completely. Instead of asking God to give me joy today, I said, okay, I'm going to rejoice. And I couldn't believe what, well, I actually could believe what happened because, you know, hey, I, I don't have to. I don't have to ask for joy. He's already given it. And, and when we rejoice in him, there, there is great power in that. And so Jesus is saying to us, claim what I've given you. I say this to you so that what? So that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. It doesn't mean that we don't have difficult days. To the contrary, Jesus is going to tell us and his disciples in just a moment, there are tough days ahead. But he is saying that in him, there is joy. And the joy is knowing my sins are forgiven. The joy is in knowing God loves me. The joy is in knowing my life has purpose because God has ransomed me and redeemed me and claimed me as his own. It's the joy in knowing that God is going to take everything, even the lousy stuff, and turn it around for good to those who love him. And that is a promise, and that's something we want to cling to and hang on to. And so Jesus then goes on, and he continues. He says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Um, as I've loved you, Jesus says, you love each other. A and that is something that all of us, the children of God, are called to do. We're called to love one another. In fact, Jesus even says in his Sermon on the Mount, we're called to love our enemies. We're called to pray for those who persecute us. And boy, if ever there were a time when the family of God needed to love one another and pray for those and love our enemies, this is the time. You know, I, I look at what has been going on in our nation, and especially with all that's gone on these last few weeks in Washington and, and beyond. You know, we see Americans so polarized and divided, and many commentators have reflected on the, the fact that never before in modern American history have we seen this kind of deep division among Americans. And the, the natural human temptation is to be angry at the people with whom we disagree. And so you have people on both sides of the spectrum, you know, mad at one another and throwing accusations. And if ever there were a time when the people of God ought to be behaving differently, this is the time. And it does not mean that we compromise what we believe. It doesn't mean that we, you know, we, we play around and, and, and minimize the truth. What it does mean is, as Christ has loved us, we love one another. And as Christ has loved us, we love even our enemies, even those we don't agree with. And that kind of love, that kind of love is transformational. Uh, it, 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 it totally changes the atmosphere. And God's people can do incredible things when we realize that he has loved me. And so I'm going to love even those who disagree with me, and even those who may treat me, treat me lousy. You know, it, it's difficult enough to love one another. It's really difficult to love our enemies. But that's what the Lord has called us to. Jan and I have laughed about it over the years, you know, with 45 years of marriage uh, un, as a experience. You know, we've learned that when both of us are, are rested, uh, we can cut one another slack when we disagree. We've learned that when one of us is rested, we can cut slack to, to the other. We have learned that when neither of us are rested, cutting slack is a whole lot dif more difficult. You know? uh, but it is worth it. It really is. And, and putting into practice what Jesus has said, love one another as I have loved you, uh, that, that, that can change so many things.
I, I look at what that does in a marriage, for instance. You know, the Apostle Paul writes to the Ephesians, and he says in Ephesians 5, verse 22 and following, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. That's sacrificial love. That means giving ourselves to our wives. And, and that, that has a profound impact in any marriage. Uh, and guys, not to pick on us, but I'm going to pick on us. The, the, the first responsibility is ours. We are called to love our wives as Jesus does. And, and that means that we are to sacrifice ourselves for our wives. We are to seek what is best for them. And, and that, that, can change, that can change a marriage, but that changes a culture. Uh, compare the difference, for instance, between cultures where Christian biblical principles have been widely accepted. Look at the way women are treated in those cultures as compared to areas where this is not the case. Uh, there, there are profound differences. I know we're living in a time where many people say, well, all cultures are equally valid. But, you know, women have been some of the most oppressed individuals in history. But where the gospel of Jesus has come and where people really practice it, it makes a huge difference in the lives of, of women. And, and God is saying, love one another as I have loved you. And that kind of love can change not only marriages and cultures, it can even change our enemies. Just recently, I, I read a uh, a book about a fellow by the name of Jacob DeShazer. Uh, Jake DeShazer was an American flyer in World War II. Uh, at the time, he was, uh, a, he was a, a sergeant and a bombardier who had been selected and volunteered to fly on a secret mission. The secret mission ended up being the raid on Japan, the Doolittle Raid, in April of 1942. Uh, it, it shocked the Japanese nation, it, it restored American morale, but Jake DeShazer ended up being captured by the Japanese and was brutally treated for many months, for actually for years, in a Japanese prisons. Uh, some of his buddies were executed. They were actually tied to crosses and shot. Uh, Jacob DeShazer was beaten, tortured, starved, and uh, as, as he described it, he said he was so angry at anything Japanese. He wanted vengeance. He wanted to, to make them suffer. It, it, you know, it, it was all consuming. And then something rather interesting happened. After being imprisoned and in solitary confinement for much of that time, uh, all of a sudden he and his colleagues were given some books to read. And among the books they were given was a Bible. Jacob de Chaser started reading the Bible, read it from cover to cover over and again. He had it for three weeks and he read it constantly. And he said as he read it, it just, it, it changed the way he thought. His mom was a devout Christian, had been praying for him. But Jacob de Chaser freely admitted in, in his life, you know, he wanted nothing to do with that. But there, in one of the most difficult of situations and in the toughest moments of his life, he started reading the scriptures, and it was a life-giving word. And he read these things that Jesus said, love one another as I've loved you. He read the Sermon on the Mount, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And he said the Holy Spirit convicted him that he needed to do that. One of his guards was an especially brutal guy. And on one particular occasion, the guard not only beat Jacob and threw him into his cell, but then slammed the door on him and slammed the door on his bare foot. Jacob's normal reaction would have been to curse and swear, and instead he decided in that moment to walk by faith. And he said right then and there he resolved that he was going to love his guard. And so the next morning when the guard came to his cell, Jacob de Chaser greeted him in Japanese. He had you know, been picking it up along the way and uh, wished him well. And, and Jake said the guard looked at him like, what in the world is going on here and quickly left. But in the days that followed, Jake continued to do that. And all of a sudden, the, the situation between the two of them changed radically.
Jacob de Chaser had lost his father when he was young. He learned from his guard that the guard had lost his mom when he was young. And they began speaking briefly. And pretty soon the guard was pouring out his heart to Jake. And Jake in turn began to love this man he had formerly cursed and hated. The, f the way it finally played out in the end is absolutely amazing. Jacob de Chaser became not only a follower of Jesus, but also resolved from reading the scripture that he would return after the war to Japan as a missionary. His guard later became a follower of Jesus, and so did many others. And uh, as Jake described it, you know, he learned in that cell that God is near, that his love is real, and that when we love others as he has loved us, it truly does have an impact, even on our enemies. By the way, there's a little, there are a number of footnotes to the story, but one of them is this. After spending many, many months, several years actually, in Japanese jails, Jacob de Chaser was told he heard an audible voice as God told him, pray for peace. And Jacob de Chaser began praying for peace and praying for the Japanese people. Later that day, Jacob de Chaser was told again he could stop praying. The war has ended. That day was a day in August 1945, the day Jacob later learned the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. That same day, Jacob told his buddies, the war is over, God told me. He told his guards, the war is over, God told me. And it's only days later that everyone learned the war is over, God told him. God is real, he is near, and he says that love can accomplish incredible things. Love one another as I've loved you, even love your enemies. If ever there were a time when the people of God needed to be doing that, boy, this is the time. And, uh, you know, we pray for, for revival and awakening in America. And we pray that that begins with us. And one of the ways it begins is that not only are we repentant before the Lord, but we take Jesus to heart and we love one another as he's loved us, and we love even those who have hurt and offended us. It doesn't mean we approve of their actions. It does not mean that we compromise our beliefs. It does mean we practice what we believe, and that is the unconditional love of Jesus in dealing with others. Well, let's continue, shall we? Jesus says, uh, verse 14, You are my friends if you do what I command, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Again, an incredible gift from God. You know, you read the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, and you will find there's one person who is called God's friend. It's Abraham. But now Jesus is saying to his followers, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. What God said of Abraham, God now says of you and me. We are his friends. Boy, can there be any better friend than God? <laughs> Seriously, um, to know that because of the Lord Jesus, I am a friend of God. And he calls me his friend. Uh, the, the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, is so true and so real. And that's what Jesus is saying to his disciples. Now, they are still his servants. In fact, the Apostle Paul will frequently refer to himself as a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, the lowest slave. But he also knows, I'm a friend of his. Yeah. He, he has called me friend. Jesus continues, he says, you did not choose me, verse 16, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. 
he continues to emphasize these fundamental themes that are the, you know, the heart of the gospel as it's lived out in our lives. And he's saying, remain in me, remain connected to me. My father loves you. I love you. Now love one another as I have been loved by the father and as I have loved you. And then he says this, verse 18, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you? A servant, note that, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. And Jesus is again saying this in the final moments of his ministry before his death and resurrection. He's telling his disciples, look, you guys have already seen some of it and you're going to see it dramatically. They hate me and they will persecute me. They will also do it to you. Uh, th there is no, you know, Jesus is the, uh, the first real proponent, uh, God is the first real proponent of truth in advertising. He does not give us just happy talk. He gives us the truth, but he gives us the promise as well. He says, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. It's why the Apostle Paul says, anyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. We shouldn't be surprised when those things happen. But he says something else, and that is, if they obeyed my word, they will obey yours as well. In other words, you will be hated because of me, but people are also going to listen. And, and that is exactly what happens in the New Testament, and it's what continues to happen today. You know, when Christians are persecuted for their faith, those are trying times. But it's often in that persecution that God does some of the greatest things. And the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit moves, people hear the word and that word transforms them. And Jesus is saying, yes, they'll persecute you, but they're also going to listen. So you speak my word, you tell them what I have said and what I have done, and they will believe. It's why Jesus was able to say, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go make disciples of the nations, because even though they'll persecute you, they will listen even as they listen to him. And, uh, you know, we see this today and we see it throughout Christian history. When God is moving most powerfully, the enemy pushes back most, most viciously. But God wins the final victory. And even when we are persecuted for Christ, he is glorified and the Father is glorified. And so Jesus then continues. He says this, Verse 21, they will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, as it is, he says, they have seen and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what was written in their law. They hated me without reasons. Quote from the Psalms. And Jesus is saying, when truth comes, the enemy pushes back. But in the end, God wins. And he's telling his disciples, you hang in there. You hang on to me. Remain connected to the vine. Understand how deeply I love you and understand how important it is for you to love one another and to show that love even to those who have persecuted and oppressed you. Today, around the world, Christian people are suffering intense persecution. The, the last hundred years, we have seen more people die for their faith in Jesus than in all the rest of Christian history combined. Uh, in these last days, the enemy is pushing back as never before. But something else is happening at the same time, and that is we are witnessing the greatest revival of faith, the, the greatest uh, awakening and coming to faith in the living God that we have seen since Pentecost. 
And uh, God is doing incredible things. And what the Lord is saying is, understand, this is the cost of being a disciple. And it's worth it. It is absolutely worth it. So don't imitate the enemy. You know, the enemy loves to yell, scream, shout, uh, create all sorts of havoc and anger and bitterness and hatred. Instead, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Love one another as I have loved you. Well, let's continue on. Verse 26, Jesus says, When the Advocate comes, the Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. This is now the third time in this short section that Jesus talks about the work of the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the consoler, the comforter. And you will recall, we, uh, last week we saw the Holy Spirit as the one who is the comforter or consoler. He is the teacher John 14, verse 6, and now in chapter 15, verse 26, Jesus describes him as the witness, the one who bears witness to Jesus, and we are now called to bear witness to him as well. He will go on in the next chapter to refer twice more to the Holy Spirit, and he'll describe him as the one who convinces and convicts people of sin and brings them to faith, and the one who reveals the truths of God. Jesus is saying, you need the Spirit of God. You need to, uh, to allow the Holy Spirit to guide, direct, strengthen, comfort, and, and lead you. We need to seek the Holy Spirit, Jesus taught. You know, ask, you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. As Luke writes and, and describes Jesus' words, he says, how much more will the Heavenly Father give His Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? And, and here Jesus is stressing that same truth once more. Then we conclude with the next several verses. And we're going to end at chapter 16 here this evening. Uh, John 16, verses 1 to 3, Jesus says, all this I have told you so that you will not fall away. Note that he's saying, look guys, I'm giving you the, the whole lowdown here so that when the difficulties come, you will not fall away. He's telling us the importance of remaining in him. And then he goes on, he says, they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. By the way, that's what the Apostle Paul felt before Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. He, he, he was, I mean, he was very zealous. And he really felt that by hunting down followers of Jesus, putting them in jail and killing them, he was doing God's work. Jesus is already telling his disciples, that's what's going to happen. The, the people who are quote unquote very religious, but who do not know the Father, you know, they're going through the motions. They, they believe it's all about obeying the rules and so forth. He says, th they're going to hate you. And he says, I'm telling you this to you ahead of time so that when it happens, you won't fall away. He's concerned about his own. He loves us. And then he says, verse 3, they will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. Uh, he is telling us, yes, it is difficult to be a follower of Jesus, but it is worth it. And uh, what God can do in our lives when we are connected to Jesus, the true vine, is absolutely, well, it's absolutely miraculous. Yeah. And that's where we need to end. That's where we ended this morning. Our, our time is pretty much concluded now. What I'd like to do is just take some time for prayer and, and particularly it's some time to pray for our nation. Um, you know, you look at what is going on in America today and, and the, the deep divisions among people and in families, uh, among people who have, you know, are neighbors who've known one another for years. And in all honesty, there is only one thing that can change those deep divisions. And that is the power of the Spirit of the living God and the good news of Jesus the Messiah. 
And so let's pray for our country. Let's pray, let's pray that, that hearts may be turned toward God and that the, you know, the, the tension that exists among so many uh, may, may, be, may be dissipated by the message of Christ becoming real in the lives of people and being shown in our lives. So let's pray. Father, first of all, we love you and we thank you for who you are and what you've done. We, we recognize this is a gift and we love you because you loved us first. May, may your love be reflected in our lives, Lord. As Jesus has loved us and given himself for us, may we love one another and love even those who are on the opposite side of the fence. Lord, continue to move in our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit that we really may love as Jesus does. And may that, that expression of the good news of Christ have an impact in our families, among our coworkers, in our places of business, among our friends, and even among those who disagree with us and with whom we may disagree. Lord, may we truly be your servants who recognize you have made us your friends. And may we show your love to all people, no matter the circumstance. And we pray it in Jesus' strong name. Amen.